Put your hands together for Pum Le Fabio. Fluent. 
So how do you do that in this world of where everything is just freaking throwing at us? You know, where do, everywhere we go, you know, subway, billboard, on the phone, there's crap throwing at us everywhere. And all I'm saying is that, you know, there's no magic way to do it. You just have to be alert and pay attention of what catches your eye. Is it an ad that is so totally quiet and, you know, a lot of white space? Or is it color that catching, or like, what is it, you know, like, make it a habit of being a student and studying visual at all times, because it, you have to, you know, if one day you want to become a CCO, you've got to be good in everything, even though you have a copywriter background, or, you know, you want to be, you know, amazing um, creative director in the future that be able to kind of point your team to the right direction, you need to know all these things. And, you know, be aware of what is now and what it was produced before in the past so you can project what you can do that be different in the next. So I'm going to walk you through two projects uh, in detail and I uh, want to leave a little bit more time so you can do the big <coughs> Q&A. So whatever you have in mind, question for me, write it down so you don't forget. So first client is Hong Kong Ballet. Uh, Hong Kong Ballet is one of the premium dance company in Hong Kong and they came to us and asked us to help them rebrand because they have this crazy perception problem. Their subscription was way down, people don't go to see ballet anymore because it's very difficult art form when you think about who they are going to see ballet and who goes in movie and concert and all that stuff. So it's not the coolest you know, form of entertainment. So the new um, artistic director, his name is Satine Weber, came to me and asked me to rebrand the whole entire organization. So I asked them to share with me you know, what they have currently, and this is what they said. What a mess. You know, photography is all over the place, the typography, there's no brand standard. Color is not consistent. Sometimes they use like beautiful fashion photographer shooting. Sometimes I don't know what they're thinking. You know, like some of this production, of course, no one is not going to see. But there's three. When we do more research and you know talk to the audience, current audience, and people on the street, um, we found there's three problems in Hong Kong ballet. First one is the perception that people think ballet is for the rich, you know, for the elite, and, and, and you know, it's an art form, it's hard to understand, and it's expensive to get, and so, you know, people don't bother to go. So we know that we have to reach a much more younger audience and much more broad audience, make ballet relevant to um, today, modern um, entertainment, right? So we try to reach the Henry, I call the Henry, which is spelled H-E-N-R-Y, High earning, not rich yet. <laughs> okay, so like they might not get the ballet, but like you know, the more we can talk to them, the, the you know, there might be interest in the future to maybe buy one or two tickets for the show during that cracker season or something like that. Second one, the brand consistency needs to be in every touch point. So, you know, from typography, design, color, whatever the hell you do, six second spot. Uh, advertising campaign, brochure, it got to be consistent from the design standpoint, color, the way it speak, everything. And third, we need to make Hong Kong as a whole city fall in love with ballet again. But that's hard to do because people don't care about ballet. So how did we do? We stunned the world with this beautiful art and I think that's like we let the ballet dancer be the hero. Right? So this is the image. When you look at it, it's, it's pretty, but there's a lot of meaning to this. Instead of using beautiful ballerina that is like very super princess in pale pink, we, we show them in a very strong, you know, almost like army of ballerina. This is a new era of Hong Kong ballet that is different. You know, they stand in a row, they are laid straight out in almost a like geometric form. Their hair is sticking up, almost mimic the side skyline of Hong Kong. Very, you know, there's something about this image that is quite arresting, and people remember it. This is a building called Yin Fat Building in Hong Kong. Everyone who travels to Hong Kong will go to this building and take a picture. 
And as you can see here, you know, we don't, I told the, um, the artistic director that I'm not going to put the dancer in a leotard, in a prince costume, because that looks ridiculous. Like, people cannot connect with that kind of um, image. So, you know, we make the two male dancers very strong, was at athletic kind of like, and dress them up. This can be Nike or Adidas ad, you know, something that anyone who look at it is like, okay, that's cool, and that's ballet. So that's the kind of image that we want to project forward for, uh, you know, this new season. This is a jumbo restaurant where, you know, we have two server, kind of like he's like flipping her. This girl can't swim, she freaked out the whole time. Um, so, you know, some, there's something that's kind of whimsical about this shot, you know, and as you can see, the apparition is really tight. He used the color red that is very, that's represent new beginning uh, in China, and red is a auspicious uh, color. We use the red throughout the whole time. Um, we use design principle for this particular shot of repetition and symmetry. And you know, as you can see, you know, we want to combine a modern ballerina with an ancient temple. So for her, like this is like we designed everything in this photo, like she is uh, has in this bob wick, which is circle, with the circular form and the skirt lip up, you know, it's it's on this circle and then we shot it right in front of the circle door. And in this like really, really old temple in Hong Kong. So it's that combination of news and all. This is another shot of showing the strength of the ballet dancer, how strong it is, almost he's like flying up almost like a those Kung Fu movie, you know, like the Hong Kong Kung Fu movie that people are flying in the air. And, and when you look at this, it, it's like a painting from Michelangelo in a way. So mixing the East and the West together. And sometimes you just get lucky. So this is one of the shots that we did not plan to shoot. But then I had a lunch meeting with the producer in Hong Kong. She took me to this place. I was like, why the hell are we not shooting at this location? Because I love the color. Um, this is like 1960, uh, really old, kind of crappy restaurant, but I found a lot of beauty in it because it's like, you know, the tiles, the graphic that has been untouched since the 60s. And we thought, you know, is there a way that we can create an interesting photograph, you know, with this really tiny space? And you can see this really how we hit it. So I call some teams a team. Let's like try to figure it out what we can do. So this is the artistic director and me like try to compose, you know, the photo, um, you know, the day before, and we end up shooting it. And that's probably one of my favorite shots of out the whole thing. So as creative director, you know, sometimes you have a plan, but when you see something better, you have got to be ready to change because you got to push yourself. You know, don't settle down for anything less than the best. Now, when it comes to for branding, typography needs to be consistent. As you, see, you can, as you can see before, the type was all over the place. Sometimes it's script, sometimes it's center, sometimes it's serif. So we have to design a design system that will work internally with their in-house. So we end up doing one font only, and this font called Tomika, but we express them different way because I hate Sometimes when we do a lot of design and branding for client, I think it will be a big failure if we design something that's too hard for an in-house to do because you've got to be able to create a system that they can duplicate and replicate anytime they do it, you know, a fly or stuff like that because they would, you know, have agencies doing all those. So, you know, success is about consistency. Um, then we have to do show shot because they have 10 shows every year, so everything at the design, we always start with a sketch, and this is, you know, all different sketch from Alice in Wonderland to Gate Gatsby to the cell, and, you know, we use color red and blue, maybe navy blue, kind of threading the show, whole show together. And this is how we express typography with the photography. One font, very powerful, very recognizable as Hong Kong Ballet, and it's, you know, when it's coming every month, 
people see, you know, that this is the brand name and how we express the brand. So the type is jumping and, you know, in created in echo as dynamic as the, the photo itself. You know, so never just like stick the type and put a headline on there. You can do a lot with the type. You know, type is giving a voice to a still photography. So you know, when you have a really good copy, it's not like you know, big copy. I mean, a big photo and then a little copy in the center. Or maybe you put copy in the front and center, turn it upside down. So that the type should express as much as the image as well. And you know, after we launched this campaign, subscription went up 130%. Not only we put Hong Kong Ballet in the in the in the in the in the, in the art in the art world, and um, you know, even like CNN Travel did a big article about it, and it's great because it's you know reaching beyond just the dance industry. You know, like people start looking at. Hong Kong Ballet differently that, okay, this is a super cool brand. And I think that was the result that, you know, 130% in terms of subscription went up. So, you know, sometimes when you do something right, you have fans. So this is a company in China called Little Swan with a campaign that inspired by the Hong Kong Ballet. I remember one day, like literally get this three people from, I have friends in Bangkok and in Malaysia and China, shot me these images and everyone said the same thing, have you seen this? Or one of my clients like, oh, did you, did you do another campaign for Little Swan? I was like, what are they talking about? So, um, yeah, I mean, it's inspiration, that's what they say, but you know, that's why visual is so powerful, because once you, you, when you see it once, and it's implanted into your brain, when you see it again, you know that it either it's, you know, has been done before, or was a copy, or whatever, and um, so I take it as compliment, I told myself, you know, when, the day that no one copy our work, that's when we should be worried. <laughs> so that's a compliment. And of course, uh, the clients enjoy another round. This is when on Diet Prada, they compare like each one, and they enjoy another round of PR. So second year, the sophomore effort is even more difficult because the uh, first year was so successful for them. Uh, so team was like, you know, it's second year anniversary of the Hong Kong Ballet, and we want to create uh, a film to celebrate 40 year anniversary. And I thought, okay, I don't know what we're gonna do yet. Uh, let me think about it. And uh, look back to my previous trip to Hong Kong. I remember this visual, you know, when I think of Hong Kong, I think of this crazy tall red building and pastel color that is authentically not like any city in the world. So we thought whatever um, concept's gonna be, some, the execution gonna need to be brought in with this kind of color that celebrated the diversity and the culture of uh, people of Hong Kong. So the idea, we asked ourselves, can we create a film and redefine, reimagine ballet? You know, but can we combine um, ballet with a pop culture. So when you think about pop culture, you know, what do you think? You think of like basketball, sport, um, music, hip hop, you know, fashion and food, you know, things that people care about, things that people watch. So how do we bring that into a classical ballet? Um, so we, uh, in a, I'll walk you through step by step, but let's take a look at the, uh, the film first that we come up with for the 40th year's anniversary. <laughs>
reception in front of the Bank of Hong Kong, and it's like Times Square. You can't pull a permit. Like, they won't let you stop the traffic. It's too busy. But I'm like, I insist to shoot there because that's the most, like, coolest graphic. It is a great representation of Hong Kong. And then we did it. All right, so when the video came back, of course, we did all the edit and stuff. It's a little bit hard to see. So version one, it was absolutely miserable. This is off camera, super sad. The world is going to end tomorrow. <laughs> By the way, it looked, it's so dark, and the bands are green. I mean, they were so cold. I mean, this lady is like 80 pounds. I mean, super skinny, no fat. I mean, it's like so cold for them. I mean, they're just like not happy. Um, so we like, you know, edit them. And we work with like really good com uh, company called Company and they're like, no problem, we are such a wizard when it comes to color. So they did the color grade and came back with version tool. And they were like so proud. It's like, you know what? This is not, this is way off. It's not the pastel color, it feels like New York, it doesn't feel like Hong Kong. We got to redo this. Like, you know, my lavender suit is now like bright ass blue, it looks stupid. Um, so, like, you know, it's, like, but then we just like back and forth, back and forth, you know. Sometimes you have to explain. As a creative director, you have to explain in detail of what to do in your head. So I was like, you know, it's to New York City, this is Hong Kong, it's about to be lighter and brighter. So they come back with like version three. Pretty good. But then, you know, the color, the yellow was a little bit, it's not neon or lime green enough. And they were like, this, this shit is crazy. <laughs> it looks the same. It's like, no, 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 it's not the same. It's right now, it looks like MTV VH1 in the 90 music video. I'm trying to take the Hong Kong ballet to the future. Like, can you give me a cool temperature, a 68 degree, beautiful day with a soft box on top? And you know, the girls need to feel pale and the green, neon has to pop up. You know, let's. If this is a movie about year 2050 in Hong Kong, what it should feel like, and you know, it's a lot of like abstract word that makes sense, but not really makes sense. But it's our job to communicate that feeling, you know, the temperature. I was like, you know, this one looked like they are sweating their ass off while they're dancing. We got to like cool it down and be very descriptive. And then they came back the way like I had it in my head. And it's all of us responsible to be in charge of that destiny of your work. Only you, that you know, you are a creator of this. You, you know what in your head and you have. When it's not there, it's not there. So be very, very thrilled in your work. Okay, our direction on Stoloi. This is the print sketch, you know, and uh, when we said the concept to the client, the client was like, okay, this is drawing. Human can't really do this <laughs> on top of this course, but it's just like drawing. We draw it anyway because it's like a cool shape and it's created this fun graphic. Don't I mean for how even a like, you know, hands down and like this thing or this shot of the four guys like jumping. I mean that street is so narrow. But then we kind of create like the goal, like this is where we want to land and work closely with the artist artistic director who create the shape in the air and you know like practice the dancer that you know you would be doing this, 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 this. Because each shot we have about half an hour to shoot. So they kind of have to sync together before coming, even though it's print, you, you still have to photograph it. And this is uh, the final. Uh, we take the audience into uh, celebration of 40th anniversary of Hong Kong Ballet, very positive and um, joyful uh, feeling that you know people have about Hong Kong and ballet in general, and using color as a thread girl. And you know we got, um, of course, a lot of press, and because the video is very easy to share. But um, when we got this press on the Washington Post, the front page of Art and Style, I thought you know it's interesting. What we do here. You I mean you guys know what's going on in Hong Kong right now, right? And lots of protests, you know, uh, every weekend, and we were shooting like at the beginning of it. And you know, all of us as a creative, we have an opportunity to project really positive image to the world. You know, like when you see stuff 
uh, like press from Hong Kong, there's like people are fighting and smoke and gun and police. You know, us, like mean, what the power that we have to be able to say, you know, as an artist, as a creative, you know, we project this kind of image. And and for me, I mean it's much deeper and more meaningful to be able to contribute this kind of visual to the world. Alright, so let's move on to the second uh, high end. So you guys might say, well, oh, it's easy to brand Hong Kong ballet because the subject is beautiful and you know the dancer, they all and whatever you do is gonna look good anyway. How about eye doctor, you guys? How about the opticians? So Georgetown optician came to us and asked us to help them rebrand from just a regular eye doctor to a fashion destination of all things I wear. Like, you know, it's like, how do I make opticians, eye doctors sexy, right? So we, um, I asked the client why, why do you want to get into fashion and stuff. They said, you know, there's a this new, new business model, uh, you know, for our family. This is a family company, by the way, it has been around 30 years, and, uh, and they have several um, retail store in the Atlantic US and, and they thought you know there's an opportunity to grow the business by combine the, the uh, medical with the retail experience. So I thought it was an interesting idea you know but then you have so many competitors out there like our eye who wear big Parker where you can buy online glasses like for $99 a pair or you can go to Neiman Marcus or Netherparte who wear high end uh, glasses, so like how an eye doctor going to stand out, you know? So we came up with a concept called Our Family Knows Glasses because what's different between them and the rest of other retail um, are they are family owned. And this knowledge of eyeswear has been passing down from generation to generation. So we told them that, you know, let's do two episodes of the film, tell kind of like similar true story of this family, uh, this family with uh, eyewear and eyes obsessed family. And um, we do like one launching in the fall and one launching in the spring. So I'm only going to show you the spring one. And this is an episode called uh, Eyeball, where uh, the kids, the dad and the kids uh, went to see the grandma, who's like the Jedi of all these eyes we have. So let's take a look. The eyeball was the event for the ocularly obsessed. Time for the family to take off their glasses with she who taught them to see. Grandma Ida, mother of matriarchs. Ida had recently employed a butler named Eyeball, who eagerly catered to Ida's every appetite and whim. The eyeball wasn't exactly a wall, more a pretext for the family to polish their skills and alter of their idol, Ida. A time to indulge their fixation on fashionable friends. And to view their most precious heirloom, the first glasses Ida ever made. Priceless, irreplaceable, Mesmerizing stuff great optometry dreams are made of. Comfort pinched her mind. The glasses had been napped. Who would do such a dastardly deed? Did I not just have eyes for Ida? Or designs on her designs? I didn't do it. Who done it? It was time to call in the highways. A back call the same. And off they went. When cornered, the culprit calmly confessed she borrowed the specs for a night of her time. With the hounds. It's always the quiet ones. 
Georgetown optician. Our family knows glasses. And that's for your eye doctor. The best client, you know, the best client is always should be the one that you have right now. That is often your opportunity. It doesn't matter if it's like a toothpaste or mouthwash or soda. I mean, if you set um, your goal and set your mind to push your creativity, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. Like you can do it. I mean, this is for the eye doctor, right? Um, so anyway, so we use this typography of the eye chart throughout the whole entire um, branding experience from digital to um, advertising, online, offline, and so on. And you know, of course, we would have known that you know, it's going to end up on Trendlands and Adweeds and you know. So this family is fun. We have been running this for two years now. I wish I could show the new one that's about to come out in a week, maybe a week and a half. So you guys have to keep an eye on it. It's even crazier. Um, so to be continue. Um, and maybe we have a little bit of uh, maybe five minutes. Let me go through this project too. Uh, as a designer, now I feel very lucky because um, it has never been a better time to be the, the designer because we have an opportunity to create product with clients. So, you know, why I love doing the art direction and advertising, what I really love is changing the client image inside out to help the client develop the product. Nina Paper is a big paper <coughs> manufacturer in North America, and they came to us and asked us to help them rebrand Nina Classic. And they are uncoated paper, so when you see like the whiskey bottle or um, Mac cosmetic or Sephora shopping bags with all those paper. A lot of it is made by Nina paper. But it's time to kind of help them redefine. So not only they asked me to do uh, the advertising and the branding, but they also asked me to create and curate the new color and texture for the paper itself. So, I mean, that's, you know, a little bit difficult because it's very abstract, right? How do you predict the future? How do you create the right color that is going to sell to a Sephora or Anthropology or other retailers so the designer in-house designer can use your paper? So again, you know, back to my habit, I think it's a very good habit of looking at like different colors. Of, you know, I know I want to do red, I want to do blues, I want to do shades of grays, so orange green. Greens, you know, so like what, like how do you determine what shape of red would be the final product when there's like a thousand red out there? So we thought, um, you know, we, for the world of unfortunate, there's not really a bright red because it's really hard to produce. So I had to learn how to manufacture, to, to, to design something from scratch. And this was like a 15 month period, so creating the color from scratch to the finish line. So we start with literally mixing the paint you know, in our studio and figured out the different shades of um, red or blue or gray that we can do. And we came up with maybe 20 different color palette or waterfall and presented to the client. And you know, the client makes and match some and then finally come down with like a one palette. Then we uh, work with the scientist in Atlanta to create this color and create this recipe that is going to uh, be able to mimic in the manufacturer. And, and, and it's just you know a very kind of long process. It's almost eco art, eco science in a way, because the scientists, they don't give a shit, you know, what shit red it's like it looks the same to it. <laughs> it's like this is like this red and this red is like no, this is too blue, this red is too orange. And he's just like, oh my god. <laughs> so pushing you know him to like to get like the really, really bright red and the cobalt blue, which is really hard to achieve on an uncoated, uncoated sheet. Then we take this recipe and went to production and we create like a thousand and thousand pounds of paper, you know, to uh, to, to, to for the final products. Um, so it was kind of fun, you know, I, I, I love learning by doing it and somehow I feel lucky that the client give us trust uh, to create something, like even like a product that is going to move their business. 
Um, now, our correction. So once we done with the product design, then we have to create the art correction. This is Nina Classic. So we want to look at different era of art history from Renaissance period to uh, Art Deco to modern art to surrealist to uh, digital. So like kind of like different era of art history and we interpreted them in a new and modern way. So this is the cover for the Nina Classic. So we came up with three different product lines. One is Nina Classic Press, which is complete communicator. Nina Classic Linen, uh, which is luxury, sensible luxury. So this paper is used for like cosmetic and high end um, jewelry box or watch, uh, you know, like all the gift box during Christmas um, and uh, classic texture. And of course, we have to do a lookbook to explain all this product. So, you know, this art direction of like Renaissance girl was talking about color palette, but it's a modern take, right, on the Renaissance with the color or like the envelope. You know, why do you need different shades of white? You know, why there's thousand shades of white out there and how do you use them? Or like, you know, digital printing is like the new trends. So, you know, educate designer to uh, learn about color and texture. And of course, have to work in, in every medium. Like anything that we do, we have to pick it out 24 ways, you know, to, to for different vertical. So I just want to leave with you guys today. Um, I think we are living in a visual first world right now, uh, where a lot of stuff is thrown at us visually, and it's become much harder and harder to stand out in in anything that you do. So, you know, I would encourage you guys to be visually fluent, like try to see as much as you can. Because when you see what has been done, it's going to inform you of what to do or what not to do, because that's been done before, I've seen it before. So it make yourself, push yourself to break through that norm by having knowledge of what's going on, right? And um, also, you know, it's, it's your job to push your work. You know, your boss, your client might say, you know, you can't do it, that's too much. Um, I feel like, you know, sometimes we create, a, like, you know, from the business standpoint, we just dumb down the audience. I mean, the audience is so visually uh, knowledgeable now. Like, they, they see stuff all the time, so it's super hard to break through. I mean, when, think about when you all go scroll through the Instagram, right? I mean, it's not even, it's like, like this. And then if you it's take like you got to find something like really cool, you know, in the sprint second you say, okay, I'll give it a like. I mean, it's that much and that competitive now, you know, when you create a visual. So you know, whatever you have in your head, you know, make sure like you push it and make it reality. And if anyone ever question you or like scare that you know it's too much for our audience. I want to leave you with this quote, one of my favorite quotes of all time by my idol T. Bob Carmen. He said, when you make something no one hates, no one loves it. And that is true. Because you say absolutely nothing. And there is, for me as a creative, there is nothing worse than we eat other people's success. And there is nothing worse than the mediocre. You know, my analogy is that it's like, you know, you're trying to cross the road, you know, either you stay in here or you cross the road all the way. You never to want to cross the road and be in the middle, you know, because that's when you get run over both way and that's a very dangerous place to be. So push your creative and fight for it, go for it, because that's every single job that on your table now is your chance to shine your career. So, thank you. We've got time for questions, yeah. I'm sure there'll be plenty. I can see the art directors in the room salivating over every slide. So, um, make the most of this opportunity because there's some amazing work that she showcased and the passion behind every decision as well. Um, come on, who's got a question? Okay. And copywriter too, I think word and visual. I mean, sometimes we write, you know, we, that's like, we start with, when, when people say,
say sketch. People think it's just sketch drawing. Sometimes it's sketch kind of writing. You know, your thought. Like it's, it's not necessary one thing or another. I'm actually a writer, so thank you. Great. And also, I mean, this was fantastic. So Thanks. amazing work. Um, quick question: What's the next frontier for you? Like, what would you want to breathe that next? What element of design do you want to disrupt? I hate using the word disrupt because I think it's overused, but like, what's the next thing you got your eyes set on? Like, what do you want to do and blow out next? Um, I think the client come to design army now, not knowing of what they want, which is a very kind of interesting space to be. You know, when I start my business 10 years ago, the client come in like, we need a brochure, we need an ad campaign, we need to, uh, you know, very specific need. You know, now they rather come with like a business problem. How do I, how do you help me rebrand a hotel that now is a yacht or a boat that is going to sail around the world? So you have to kind of come up with the branding, brand and identity, not so much of what it looks like, but how how do we brand that experience. So like now I'm designing, let's say, one of a big hotel with Carlton, I help consult uh, in terms of like design experience of when the guest is coming to the hotel, uh, what do they need to do at every property to have that consistent experience, whether we go to Bali or um, you know, Bangkok or Shanghai or London, you know, what do they need to do to create this um, memorable moment at all this part and property. So it's like, you know, the word design, it's very broad. I mean, you, you can be designed as a designer, you can design experience, you can design furniture, you can do digital design, you can do um, sound design, you know, the, uh, and, and I think now, I, push myself to learn every facet of it. You know, with the Hong Kong Ballet, it was the first time I worked with a sound design company to create the sound that matched the vision. So again, you know, never stop learning. You know, be a firm believer on learning by doing and don't be afraid. Because things change all the time. What you do today may not be relevant six months from now. So, you know, at my age, you know, I, I, I have to keep up with the kids. I have to keep up what's the next. And a lot of time it's the gut feeling, you know, be able to predict what's coming up next. Um, it's very important. That's awesome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question over there, yeah. Do you ever work with clients that ask for something that it's not quite reflective of who they are as a brand? So for example, like a retail brand that isn't quite as sexy as the thing that they're looking for from you? Yeah, of course. I mean, we get, I mean, we are much more boutique, you know, um, agency, so we have ability to pick and choose the client we want to work with, so it's a little bit different than, you know, a big uh, at a global ad network. So we, I think the client already does homework. When they come to us, they, they look at our work and, you know, have a request for proposal and then that's it. I mean, I have to have to pitch it in my life. They come to me. And I don't believe in the work. <laughs> so you, you're pretty much aligned with what they're yeah, yeah, and then you know, of course, there's you know, 15 years of uh, been in this business. Sometimes, you know, sometimes the client um, has certain expectation, and they feel like, oh yeah, this time is gonna take us somewhere cool and different. But then they're afraid, you know. And then I can, I'm pretty good at selling the design, and you know, put the confidence on the work, so the client feel confidence too. But sometimes it's just not in their DNA. It's like a really, you know, a very struggle. It's a, it's a struggling. So it usually we just kind of like, let's get divorced. I think it's better if you go find your wife because <laughs> it's just not working. And it's, sometimes it's better that it's, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But most of the client, um, it, it's working out because when they hire us, they know what they get into. You know, we're not going to have you know, 15 account executive on, I mean, it's, it's not like that at all. It's me working directly with 
example of the Ritz Carlton. So the I mean already go in, we go in, in as a partner, rather as um, you know, a partner with the business rather than a uh, an agency. So, you know, it's we do like dinner and then we brainstorm, so the work relationship is much different.